Good morning and welcome to the Grow Connection Network. Here at the Grow Connection Circle, we have been meeting since October 7th, literally right after Yom Tov. We decided to increase our weekly Grow Circle from Mondays, where we grow through dancing and learning about the prayers. We increased it to Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and we also meet on Thursday nights for Grow Through Parsha. And we always started with prayers for Israel and dedicating all of our good thoughts and learning and bitachon, which we're growing here, to our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land and for peace in the entire world. And of course, for our ultimate goal to bring the geula. So Wednesdays is such an exciting day where we welcome a wonder woman who is actively involved in bringing the geula to the world and is truly a wonder. And how do we bring geula? So the word gaila in Hebrew means exile. And it's only one letter away from Geula, which is Aleph. So when we recognize the Aleph, the master of the world, the oneness of Hashem in creation, and through the Torah and Tefillah, we are going to bring Geula. But there's one more. And that is if you take the letter Aleph and you switch it around, you get the word Pele. And Pele means wonder. What does it mean to be a wonder woman? It means that we use the challenges in our lives to reveal the highest level of Hashem. And that really is Geula, where we transform our actual challenge into the light that we shine in the world. And so being that I, I have known Ida since she's 12 years old, it's been such an honor and privilege to see how you've blossomed and grown through all these years and truly taken your life and the challenges and the strengths that Hashem has given you to be a huge light in the world. And so I'm so glad to see you, your mother, and I also want to welcome your husband, David. I'm so glad that you're all here, or David. <laughs> And it's really amazing to see what a wonder woman you have become. And every day I hear more and more about the light that you're spreading globally. And I'm so inspired by the podcast from the inside out all the time. So I'm going to formally introduce you, but of course, I just could not say hello to you and explain why we call this Wonder Woman Woman Wednesday. And really everyone that's here is a wonder woman and the way that we become a Wonder Woman is that we just stay in wonder. When we are faced with life's challenges, instead of complaining, we ask ourselves, I wonder what Hashem wants from me in this situation. I wonder how I can reveal his light. And that makes all the difference. So the first way is we are going to use this opportunity that we're all gathered here to recite a chapter of Tehillim together. So please join me. Chapter 21, which is really all about trust in Hashem. Shir Lamalais Esa Enai El Harim Me'ayin Yavai Ezri. A song for a sense. I shall raise my eyes to the mountains. From where will my help come? So at a time where we do not see the solution, we turn to Hashem, Ezri me'im Adonai, Aiseh shamayim ba'aretz. My help is from Hashem, the maker of heaven and earth. And from the word ayin, where you see the word ayin, from where, it also means from nothing. Hashem can do anything. And that's what bitachon is, that from nothing our help can come. And we are so certain of that because we trust in Hashem. He will not allow your foot to falter, your guardian will not slumber. 
Behold, the guardian of Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Adonai shamracha, Adonai silcha, al yadi minacha. The Lord is your guardian. The Lord is your shadow. He is by your right hand. Yomam hashemesh layakeka, biyareach balayla. By day, the sun will not smite you, nor will the moon at night. Adonai yishmarcha mikara, yishmar es nafshecha. Hashem will guard you from evil. He will guard your soul. Adonai yishmar teischa uvayecha me'ata bi'ad aylam. Hashem will guard your going out and your coming in from now and to eternity. And we take a moment to think about all those who are in captivity. May they all come home swiftly and all of our chayalim should be safe and sound and also come home. And may all the Jewish people come home to our holy land in true peace. So um, Wednesdays, we also start out with a bitachon idea, a trust, thought, and meditation. And we are going to use our Grow Trust Planner, which some of you have it. And the Grow Trust Planner you'll hear about was really an idea from Ida. And it is slowly making its way around the world. Thank God it is a planner with daily inspiration from Shar HaBitachon, the gate of trust, which I know that Ida is very passionate about. And so what we're going to do is just give you a little taste of this book that was published and actually completed only in September. It was really a preparation for these days where who, who would know how much we need bitachon and trust in Hashem during these times? Somehow, Ida was already spreading it way before, and I had come up with the GROW method with, with God's help, and we combined the two. The GROW method is a method of praying, it's a language of prayer and combining it with the grow with the with the trust really helps us integrate it. So we're going to do this just for a few minutes before we hear all about how it came to be. So everyone if you have a pen and paper you can take out your own um and I'm going to share the screen and you can try it yourself just to get a little taste of how we can grow our trust. Um, okay, so the first thing is there's an idea that I'm going to share from a video. So the Grow Trust Planner um, is based on the on the Shar Bitachon, and then Linda Schwartz, who's on here, she asked me to learn and work with her daughter and her daughter would also volunteer for JGU and together we learned the Shara Bitachon and and composed the the daily inspiration and then Linda asked are you teaching it and so when we started the Grow Circles I decided to focus Wednesdays to Shara Bitachon and then Linda said what about the people who don't come on live can you make short videos and so she sponsored those videos and many more people have joined. And I want to just share one that we're gonna to base today's grow reflection on. So our source of strength. So we all need lots of strength during these times. And what is the secret to our source of strength? Where, where does it come from? How do we have the strength over thousands of years to survive, persecution, challenges. And so this would be, I so far have 30 videos, which would be for the first 30 days of the planner. There are 111 days. So I'm going to pick day four. And can you all see it? Okay. So day four, each one gets a little better because I was practicing in the beginning. So let me just, um, we'll start with so what is the Jewish people's source of strength to survive terror and persecution? 
Our enduring strength in facing adversity goes beyond emuna faith. It is the power of our personal connection with God, called bitachon, that ensures our survival. I recognize that a Jew is beyond belief. We are one with God. A challenge is an opportunity to grow connection with God. We pray and wish for the safety and security of our brothers and sisters in Israel. Grow Bitachin number four, just our good. source of strength. I'm grateful for the miraculous existence of our people throughout history. So what is the Jewish people's source of strength? Okay, so what is the, what is the miraculous source of strength that we all have? To grow, to build, to rebuild, where does it come from? So take a moment, let's grow through this thought, which is actually in the intro of the Grow Trust, the Shar Habitachon. It's based on this amazing book, the Felig edition, Gate of Trust. And each day also has the page numbers that you can refer back to the book. So here is um, here is what that book looks like. It actually matches. We made it triangles to match the Grow, the, the Gate of Trust. And uh, I wanted to share, I wanted to thank Ida and David Schattenstein for sponsoring this book in honor of your daughter's bas mitzvah, which was in 2022. So we've been working on it since then. And it's been such a gift to work on this and to bring this to the world, especially at this time. So I'm truly, truly grateful to you, Ida, for coming up with this idea. And Day four would be right here. This is what we just read about. And you see at the top, there's the idea. And then you start out with gratitude. Gratitude is the way a Jew starts the day with Moda Ani, the morning blessings. So if we begin, everyone here, write down something that you're grateful for. And you can connect it back to this concept. So, for example, I'm grateful for every challenge that Hashem has entrusted to me. The challenges that have helped me grow. Recognition and in gratitude, we can also just be grateful that we're here together, that we're Jews, that we have the internet to connect all of us. I'm grateful for the 32 people who made time in their morning to join us today, each and every one of you. Add your light to this circle. And now recognition. This is verses corresponding to the verses of praise. So this is the way a Jew prays. It's also the language of connection because tefillah really means connection. So how do we communicate to achieve connection? We look into the sitter for the language. And we can use it to connect to ourselves, to our core, to our creator, and to each other. So I recognize how does, how do challenges deepen my connection with God in my daily life? So I can become a victim or I can use it to reveal a greater light. As the Talmud says, all of creation, darkness precedes light. So I can recognize that this darkness is just a stepping stone to bring a greater light into the world. So I would say, I recognize the challenge of loss, growing up without a father from age 10, um, inspired me to start a camp for girls where their emotional well-being is very, very much important to me. <laughs> and that has grown into 
creating the Grow Connection Network, where we train educators and mentors and create a support framework for women as well. So I recognize that these challenges have only shaped me. And I'm just, I'm not making this about me, but I just wanted to give you all an example. So I hope you can all then apply this to your own lives in this moment. And I recognize that the strength of our people gives all of us strength today because history repeats itself and we can look back at history to derive strength and trust in Hashem. They are giving us the strength. And so the oneness is now the Shema Yisrael. And we can all say Shema Yisrael together and feel the oneness of community of Jewish women who are bringing Geula, feel the oneness with yourself, with your soul, the oneness of your mission in this world, and the oneness with all the people throughout history that have gone through so many challenges, the oneness with our Jewish brothers and sisters in Israel right now, knowing that we're all beyond belief. It's not the only the belief that has kept us going. It's our personal connection with Hashem. It's our active relationship with Hashem, being real and authentic about it. That's the oneness. So in oneness with Hashem, I trust Hashem in today's challenges that I have the strength and I will take that next step. And that is right now with all of you. And now the wishes, what do I need? What do we all need from Hashem? I wish for a meaningful connection with God. I wish to feel it. I wish for Hashem to strengthen my trust in Him, to reduce the fear, the tension, the stress in life, and to help me really see that He's with us in a revealed way, and that would manifest in revealed goodness in everyone's life. And that is how we grow trust. So take a moment now to ready, set, grow. Take a moment to write your own grow. And then the oneness also could lead to own it. You can write notes here. You can write your action steps. You can write your thoughts. If you read the book, you can write some more notes on it that would help integrate these beautiful ideas that we really want to live with. Because the difference between Amuna and Bitachon is that Amuna is in our head. Bitachon is in our heart. It's not just that God exists. It's that I live with God. He's with me in a dira bitachtainim, in the dwelling place that I am creating for him, in every thought, in every feeling, in every experience, in every joy, and in every sorrow. I live with God and it's the same oneness of Hashem that permeates every moment of my life. And that is why when I have a thorn in my life, I realize that it's an opportunity to grow just like the thorns preserve and protect the rose. So that is something, if you have this journal, you can do it at the end of your day. You can do it in the middle of your day as a moment to reconnect, to reset. And at the end of the day, you can or even at the end of a session, you can say, today I learned and my hopes for tomorrow. And so um, for me, this has been literally like medicine. Challenge is an opportunity to grow connection with Hashem. So you have another way to integrate is, is taking out the markers and connecting to the inner child and just having a good time. <laughs> And then this is, I want to end off with this one before we introduce our Wonder Woman. We see that the world is always running and looking for the next healing modality, medication, um, alternative medicine, something. We're looking, we're searching. We are living in a time of healing and geula. There's so much more that's accessible to us. And there's so much more that we know than in previous generations. But there's one medicine that Ida has really brought to all of us. And that is inspired by the Lubavitcher Rebbe who wrote to someone who was in a depression, a chassid 
who was living an observant life. And he wrote to him, I'm extremely surprised at your low spirits. A person studies and studies, but when it comes to practical application, where is the trust? We are born with the Muna, but the trust takes work and intention. And that's what this gift that Ida has given to all of us can help us attain in our lives. Because the Rebbe told this chassid, you should study Shar Habitachain, the gate of trust, three or four times. So I want to let you all know that this book has 111 days, covers the entire gate of trust. If you use three a year, you are you are studying Shar Habitachain three times. And I have to tell you that the days that I don't do it, I feel a difference. And I'm like, I need my medicine. Okay. <laughs> and you know, from the from when I did the just now doing the grow, it just creates a great opening um, to starting out anything. And so this is the back page. I want to thank those who made this happen. Um, so I want to thank Linda for connecting me to her daughter, Sivan, in her gap year before college. And we study Charbitachon three or four times a week to create this. And, and then Linda is the sponsor of our weekly learning of Charbitachon. And it's been really a gift. And these and these bitachon videos dedicated to the safety and security bitachon of our brothers and sisters in Israel, the IDF soldiers, and the entire Jewish people. By us strengthening our bitachon, we are certainly going to strengthen the bitachon for Am Yisrael. And here I want to read Ida's quote as I welcome you today. So Ida wrote, the purpose of this Grow Trust Planner is to draw from the teachings of Shara Bitacha and to co-create with Hashem the life we envision with trust. Don't wait to see it, to believe it. Believe it, and then you will begin to see it. Faith is a tree, and trust is the fruit. Through focus and practice, the seed of faith grows into the sweet fruit of trust. Trust is the tool to reveal the hidden blessings into our own into all of our lives. So l'chaim, on my cup of coffee here, l'chaim, may we all reveal this goodness in our lives. May we all experience it. Just like bitachon is sensorial, it's something we want to embody in our, in our lives. May the goodness of Hashem be so revealed and in, may our whole body feel it. May we see Hashem with our eyes of flesh as it says that when Mashiach comes, we're going to all see Hashem and see that every challenge that we went through was truly the highest good. <clears throat> and with that introduction, I um, am so grateful to have this opportunity to welcome a wonder woman, Isa Schattenstein. And together, I welcome each and every one of you who are here. Hi, Dvorlea. And you know why Dvorlea is here, Ida? Dvorlea, well, why are you here? She doesn't come every time. She comes with a special Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, I'm here because I'm a big fan. I, I I buy your books every few months for people. I think it's the best present to be mm -hmm. present. And I I love it. It's It's magic. Thank you. Thank you. That's so sweet. And welcome. I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so this is <clears throat> I just made a little a little quick thing. Okay, so sorry, let me just take a drink. Lachaim <laughs> again. <clears throat> okay, so welcome to Wonder Woman Isa Schattenstein, psychotherapist, entrepreneur top number one podcast co-host from the Inside Out podcast and also founder of Shop Ready. And I will add, you're also the founder of the Grow Trust Planner from the JGU Press. Co-founder. <laughs> Co-founder, as well as the Seven Voices of Leadership, a Bat Mitzvah and Beyond self-discovery journal that is being used by schools and Chabad houses all around the world because I see them ordering it. So I just want to go back to, so I'm so grateful you're here. I'm going to just do a little recognition here. 
I'd like to recognize the threads that connect the tapestry of our lives. And the moment that is happening today is because of many moments that preceded it. All orchestrated by a loving God. And so I want to share that 29 years ago, February, I got married and I have a picture of it. And it's a surprise picture because look who was at my wedding. <laughs> can, oh my you goodness. Find, can you find yourself? <laughs> I, I should, look at, and I'm right next to you. Look at that. <laughs> And I was thinking about it. Imagine if we saw every student as an Ida Schattenstein. Every student in our class with everything that they come with, but we see not who they are right now. We see them as greatness <clears throat> unfolding. And that is, I always saw that. And in your quiet way, there was something very magical and special about you since your bat mitzvah, since that year that all of you in this grade were becoming bat mitzvah. And one second. And so with that, that has led to our, we reconnected through actually your friend, Rachel Fetterman Chanowitz, who's also in the picture somewhere. <laughs> um, we reconnected at a time where I was going through a challenge and I was, um, and as a result, we were moving to thank God a new property. And I called you to let, to tell you about it and ask you for some support. And you were so gracious. And we went back to the time that I was your teacher. It was really only for four months. It was the first time I ever taught. I was only 20 years old and I'm still teaching this age. And, um, and that led to us creating this Seven Voices of Leadership, a bas mitzvah journal, when your daughter became a bas mitzvah 25 years later. And this is truly a gift that is still being gifted to bas mitzvah girls around the world. So from one bas mitzvah to the next, may we continue in oneness to help build Jewish homes and empower Jewish women and girls to truly own their bat mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And that's what you really are, Ida. You are truly the daughter of mitzvah, shining your mitzvahs all around the world in such a beautiful way, using your talents that Hashem has given you. And I welcome you here to, since I shared this, a little bit of, a little taste of your childhood to, to open up with the question, Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you do. Okay, so you you pretty much shared the introduction there. Um, but <clears throat> okay, trying to think about where to start. Um, how about bas mitzvah? I'm twelve years old, and uh, I think at twelve we we're we're still figuring things out. Um, we we don't have it. We don't have the answers, we're children. And then we grow up and we look back at that 12 year old and we think about what that 12 year old would have wanted to hear, would have wanted to know. And um, and I think about that a lot, like what would I have said to my 12 year old self? And I think that those messages are, are crucial. And I think anyone who, it, it doesn't matter what, how old you are, have a conversation with yourself with yourself at a younger age and think about what you would say to that person, because it's so much easier to be kind to something outside yourself. And your younger self is essentially somewhat separated from your current self. And the lessons that you learn in that conversation will carry you through life and enable you to become more and more, first of all, rooted in your own truth, happier, um, more connected, it's a, it's an incredible thing. And there's a lot of, um, therapy around that, you know, your inner child, things like that. So as a child, I wasn't a very good student. I wasn't a good student period. Um, you know, I struggled a lot in the classroom as Nechama, I'm sure, you know, having been my teacher for a couple of months, I actually don't remember, um, how I was in the class, but I hope that I 
didn't make your life too difficult. And so, you know, what, what happens is when you struggle as a child, and it doesn't matter what the struggle is, it could be a struggle, you know, at school, it could be a social struggle, an emotional struggle, a mental health struggle. Every person has a struggle, you know, it's, it, it, it's part of being a human being, whatever that struggle is, you know, it's, it's the way that you move through life. And, uh, you know, you think you, okay, I'll go back a little bit. So I'll, I'll use mine. And then I want you each to think about, you know, what your struggle was as a child or what conversation would you have with your inner child? Like, what is that thing that you would want to tell your younger self? So I would, I, I, I would want to tell my younger self, um, Ida, your struggle is a gift and you might not see it right now. One day you will. And we all know that hindsight is 2020, right? What that means is that looking back, we can recognize how the things in our lives that were difficult, we understand them now in context and they, they turned us into the person that we are today. So I would say, just be patient. And, you know, every single part of your life is being orchestrated by Hashem. And even if you don't see the full picture, you will one day, and you don't know when that day will be because my day is not the same as your day. And my day is not the same as my daughter's day. But the important thing is that in every struggle, that's exactly where the opportunity is. And what often happens is we're trying to move away from it, right? And there's this, this quote, the, you find your purpose on the path you take to avoid it. It's, you're moving away from that struggle. And then you, there's this tension. And then suddenly you realize, oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. I, I'm supposed to actually step right into it and walk through it. And that's where change and, and that's where the magic happens. And um, a few just two days ago, I had the opportunity to witness this in real time happening to someone who I would say might, might change my life in many ways. And this was just two days ago. I was in Arizona and I had the opportunity to interview uh, a hostage um, who was in Gaza. She was released. Her name is Sapir Cohen. And she shared her story and she said, 30 days before October 7th, she, was, she wasn't feeling great. She was feeling a little off mentally, physically, and um, you know she was getting these stomach pains and she went to the doctor and the doctor said, you don't have anything that's you know concerning. Um, I'm actually more concerned about your emotional um, state right now. Don't be so worried, you're, you're fine. But she couldn't shake this feeling of discomfort, like something didn't feel right. And this girl, so she's not religious and, you know, doesn't dab in or, or keep Shabbos or any of that, or didn't, I should say. And, uh, but she happened to come across this person who was more observant than she was and said, this person said to her, you know, if you say this chapter of uh, Psalms to Hillam every day for 30 days, it actually can eliminate um, the uh, toxicity, negativity, and, and evil decrees from your life. And she's looking at this person and thinking, okay, this is kind of like, you know, ancient godly stuff and she wasn't going to do it. But then she's thinking and, you know, eventually she said, you know what, what's, what's the loss? Why not do it? So she decided she would say the, the capital every day uh, for 30 days. So the first few days she's reading it and it's about, you know, war and, and armies and, you know, captivity and all this stuff that is totally not relevant to her. And she was kind of feeling like, okay, I'm not really connecting to these words, but I'm going to say it because I trust that this person might be onto something. Day 30 was October 7th. Now, because she had been saying it every day for 30 days and she speaks you know, Hebrew, she was able to remember those prayers. And it was prophetic, she said. It was prophetic. And her experience in the tunnels and her optimism is just, that's just a, in and of itself a, a, an incredible, incredible thing to, to hear and witness from her which I'm hoping to be sharing this, uh, the audio of this. Um, we did a live interview with her, uh, God willing, hopefully on our YouTube channel. But so she said that it was prophetic. She began to understand why she was feeling off, what the Tehillim did for her. She believes that it enabled her to survive and to eventually be released and now travel the world. She was in Arizona. I don't know where her next stop is, but to, to share her story and to share the power of faith. And now she's starting to keep Shabbos and she's starting to become more observant because she was able to see the power 
of 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 Bitachin and how she didn't see the full picture. She didn't understand at the time. But now looking back, it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this all makes sense. And the reason I'm sharing the story, aside from it being an incredible story of Bitachin, is that in our lives, we often don't understand certain things or we don't see the good in everything. But, you know, a good life, and this is, uh, I'm borrowing this quote from someone, but it's, it's a good life is not a life in which everything is good. It's a life in which we see the good in everything. And there's such a minor distinction, you know, between those two. It's like, what? See the good? I mean, it's, it's either good or it's not. No, that's not true. Everything is good. And some people have a test of faith where they experience um, something that really, really makes it hard to have bitachayin. And it's something that, you know, look, it's a it is a test of faith. And through and like like Nahama, you were sharing earlier through Shara Bitachin, the Rebbe did. You were sharing what the Rebbe had said about the importance of working on your Bitachin because we're you know we're not born with it. It's really like a muscle. Working on it, if if you're experiencing a struggle and a challenge, and I, I would just really want to emphasize that. We all experience challenges, and if we haven't yet, we will. It's an inevitable part of life. And the question really is, what will you do with it? So we can't change the fact that challenges will come. The only question is, what are you doing with it? So you can choose to wallow, or you can choose to embrace. What's the better option, right? Now, very often that you know, people experience you know, if, use my example, right? Um, wasn't a good student and really didn't think that I was smart and or smart enough at least to do well academically. And so I internalized that message. But eventually, as I got older, I realized that my problem wasn't that I wasn't smart per se. My problem was that I was too afraid to ask the teacher a question when I didn't understand the material. That was my problem. And what I found so fascinating was that and and I and I think this happens to a lot of people, is from what I've heard. When you want to ask a question, but you're embarrassed to ask, oftentimes somebody else will raise their hand and they'll ask either that very same question or one that's so similar. And then you're thinking, oh shoot, like I should have asked it. Again, hindsight, right? So I guess I'm rambling here, a very long answer to a question of introducing myself. Now I'm remembering, but <laughs> you asked me a question. So essentially, I struggled in school. I thought it meant something. I realized it was not what I thought. And I started to go on this journey of self-discovery. It opened me up to um, embracing challenges and turning them into opportunities. And that was very empowering. And then I realized that a lot of the lessons that I learned, uh, I really, really wanted to share because um, I, I became a, ther a therapist in this process. And having worked with people during my internship, I started to see a lot of commonalities in our human experience right? Feelings of, you know, oh, not wanting to open up or, or maybe feelings of I'm not good enough for and fill in the blanks. And I thought, you know what, let me bring these lessons to other people in hopes that maybe they're missing something because I was, I was missing something and now I discovered it. So let me share it. And uh, so that's really what I did. I started the podcast, um, did a couple other things, gave some workshops, and I realized that these messages were resonating. So I hope I answered the question. It's incredible what a lifelong student you've become. A plus, incredible. And it's like every, I was going to ask you who are the influential people in your life who have shaped you. But I would say it seems like every day there's another person in your life that is teaching you and that you're drawing inspiration from all the people that you've interviewed in the podcasts are not just inspiring yourself but you're sharing this with the whole world and you're bringing, you know, world renowned teachers and giving them a voice for forever. And well, I will say that my, that my early years were a big part of, you know, the reason I, I, I do what I do today. Um, it's just having grown up in a home, like my parents are my biggest role models and having grown up in a home where I, like I really witnessed a life of, and at the time I thought it was a life of sacrifice, right? Because they really devoted their entire lives, my both my parents to 
helping other people like you know new russian immigrants were at the time it was a big deal like russians were coming and and it's not like today where you can ever you know people speak russian there's google translate this was like a new world for these people and really watching my parents give of themselves but then i realized that it wasn't sacrifice it was doing hashem's work which is very different um from that even though it is sacrifice but it's it's i need a different word for it you know um devotion is a better one so that was my those were my main role models and then over time you know every experience became a learning opportunity so everything is is significant what would you say in the work that you do today are challenges that you overcome and what powers you to keep going um so i would say today the main challenge is um listening to and trusting my inner voice and balancing that with the voices around me because there's our intuition and then there's sometimes voices of people we respect that maybe are different. So I'll give you an example. Um, okay. So let's say I have the opportunity to do something that's meaningful, right? To like go on a mission somewhere or, or give a class and that my, my intuitively, I feel like it's a good thing to do, but I have to also ask myself, is it a good thing, right? Because it's, uh, you know, it, it serves a good purpose, which yes, the answer is yes. Um, is it a good thing for meaning? Okay. I'm balancing whether it's good for me, right? My neshama, let's say, versus good for the world. And that's kind of sometimes hard to, it's, it's, I like to call it truth. Finding truth with discernment is because, okay. So the world, there's so many different messages, right? Like for example, there's a, a message. Um, if it's not a heck yes, it's a no. Let's just take that for example. We hear that a lot, right? If something's not a heck yes, it's a no. I'm saying heck, there's another word for it, but you know, in the spirit of keeping this uh, kosher. Okay. So um, we hear that and a lot of people will take that and they'll say, okay, so I guess it's a no. And then somebody will call and say, you know, oh, there's a, there's a woman who needs someone to come visit her, let's say. Well, it's not a heck yes, because I have other stuff going on. So it's going to be a no. So it's very important. And, I, and I, I've been working on this for quite a, a while now is being able to discern um, truth and, know, and, and, and bring wisdom into it because we're pulled in so many different directions. And I, I see a lot of women specifically who are being pulled in so many directions and they're constantly under stress and there's constantly this underlying tension that they experience and they bring it home and they're bringing it to their kids and they're bringing it to their families. And I think it's important and, and I'm totally guilty of this. And luckily, thank God, I've, I've you know, through learning Shah Bittachin and through other channels, I've been able to really hone in on this, but I still have work to do is you have to ask yourself like, okay, is this, okay, I'm being kind, right? I, I'm being kind to this person, but am I being kind to myself? It's, it's like a constant process of self-evaluation, like, you know, making sure that you're always keeping yourself accountable. It's, it's almost, it's dynamic. It's not, you cannot make one rule and stick with it. You have to know how to navigate truth your own truth and balancing that with the truth of, of, you know, the bigger picture. And, you know, maybe at the end we could have people share examples where I can help you know, navigate specific, um, you know, situations or, or like instances so we can get more clarity on this because I feel like I, I want to hone in on this a little more because I think it's so, so, so important and, and uh, I hope it resonates, but it, it's so important to just constantly question yourself. One example that I love that resonated was Viktor Frankl in his book. He wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning, a very famous book. He wrote that somebody asked him, what's the meaning of life? And he said, such a big question, right? Asking that question is like asking a, a chess grandmaster, what's the best move in chess, right? He can't, it's an impossible question. What's the best move in chess? Well, it depends, right? It depends on who your opponent is. It depends on the context of the situation. It even depends on what you ate the night before, right? It depends on so many factors that you cannot answer the question unless you are sitting there 
experiencing the game and knowing what to do given the, the circumstances. So that's what I mean by truth with the sermon is like, you have to know yourself. You have to understand where you're needed and you need to decide in real time what's the best thing to do in any given situation. BW, people are writing comments. You are so wise, so young, and so much wisdom. <laughs> well, I'm you curious. Look young. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say, Hannah, Mrs. Sirota, we love you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for raising such an incredible daughter. And Hi, I was Ma. wondering if you wanted to say something back to your daughter. What just from you seeing her overcome challenges, you know, you're the mother that went to all those PTA meetings. <laughs> what do you say now? <laughs> very proud, very, very proud of her and her children. And uh, it, it's amazing. Her family, her husband, uh, the whole family brings me a lot, a lot of nachas. A lot of nachas. So she compensated for all the sleepless <laughs> nights. <laughs> You know, it's what turns out, you know, I was telling my children when they have challenges with their own children, I said, if if uh, your children will turn out the way my did, you have nothing to worry besides, besides the challenges. <laughs> but Ida's children are like way uh, more uh, advanced, I would say, in many ways, more mature than she was at their age. <laughs> so, I mean, Kenan Hora, Blian Hora, they were like their, Ida's children are so much, I mean, <laughs> not that she doesn't have challenges with them, but they are just so mature and so more, like, you know, more mature and more, like, uh, I don't know, developed uh, in many ways than Ida was at their age. <laughs> So I said, all the challenges, you'll have a lot of nachas from them, Baruch Hashem. I think that's a little taste of Mashiach. Mashiach mm -hmm. comes, we're going to say, wow, thank you, Hashem, for all the challenges, mm -hmm. the way you know, you're know you sharing right now, the nachas that you feel, and that we all are benefiting from that nachas. So one of the things that you did for your daughters, Ida, is always looking for ways to empower them and inspire them and get involved in their schools and not just for your own daughters but to help others as well so this book we created seven voices of leadership based on the seven voices of the prophetesses helping jewish girls embody those voices really in a bitachon way that they live with those women as role models in their lives i can be a miriam what does that mean i can find my voice of joy even in the greatest darkness in my own Egypt. And I want to say Susan Axelrod is the first person who gave me the idea that this would be, this would be something that would go far. So we, through the coaching that I did with Susan, we developed these ideas of using the seven voices to coach ourselves and to coach young girls and even women. So I want to ask you, who are the women in the Torah or women from the past and why, you know, I never really had this conversation with you, like kind of the idea just happened and I had two months to do it. And then I was like amazed it happened <laughs> and it was totally thanks to Hashem that it all worked out and it matched and you chose the color to match the theme of your bas mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And it was, I loved that I had your design ideas, which you're so great at so how have the women of the past inspired you to create this <laughs> like why is this so important and how first of all this you? is your this is this is your uh, really your brainchild and i want to thank you for this idea because it's taken me a very long way and i'll explain why and how so you know we all the Rebbe really encouraged people to get mashpiyim, to get mashpiyais, right? To have a mashpiyah, uh, like a mentor who you can go to, someone who's more impartial, someone who you know cares about you, who has good values, and it's that's a that's it's hard to find. If I were to ask everyone in this in this room in this chat, you know, do you have a solid mashpiyah? Chances are most of us would say I'm either looking for one or no, I don't have one. I mean, that's just from my own experience speaking to people. 
it's hard to find a mashpia. Now, not to say that we can't go to different people for different things, which is encouraged, but sometimes, you know, we can't, we don't have access to someone when we're going through something and we need some direction. We don't always have access to, you know, the right person in the right time. So the seven voices, that book that, that you create, I was going to say you created because ideas are easy. It's implementation. That's difficult. And that's what you did. And you brought it to life, which was incredible. Um, I think that those seven women, and I'm going to choose one, but those seven women are incredible role models. And if we don't yet have a mentor or we're looking for one, or maybe we're in a situation where we don't have access to the right person in the right time, there's this exercise that I used to do with, with my coaching clients and also as a therapist that I found very impactful. And so I started to do it myself as well. And the exercise is as follows. Uh, you choose seven people who you admire or respect, and it could be uh, someone who's alive today. It could be a family member. It could be a fictional character, you know, from a, a show or a movie. It could be se any seven people. And you list three or four things about each of those people that you admire or res and respect about them. So for example, let's say I chose, uh, you know, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, all of us, all of us, all of I list seven, you know, I list three or four things that I admire about him. So let's say he was, he had humility, he had courage. He wasn't afraid to, to speak his truth despite being surrounded by opposition. And um, so after I listed those seven people and then three or four things for each person, and, and I would encourage you all to try this, is you find common denominators. Like what, what characteristic, what trait keeps showing up for you? And let's say, for example, for me, courage kept showing up, you know, being able to step into my, uh, you know, zone of discomfort, not knowing the outcome of whatever it is that I'm, I'm taking on. So that's something that kept showing up. And so once you have those things, then you have some direction because when you're going through a challenge, you can ask yourself, well, what would someone with courage do in this situation? What would someone who's willing to step into their zone of discomfort um, not knowing the outcome, what would they do? And so that really gives me a lot of direction. And so one of the people that I chose in my seven, um, and it's it's so Hashkacha Pratis that it's seven voices. The book is seven voices, a seven, you know, Navi Ice. And this, this is a totally, this is not my exercise. This is an exercise that I found in a textbook that a lot of therapists use and a lot of coaches use. So it's not mine, but it, but I've been using it. And so one of them is Esther Hamalka. And I connected to Esther because she also had courage and she did something not knowing the outcome. She had to go to Ahasuerash. And obviously with her, the risk was so great. And she could have been killed for going to see the king. And by the way, she actually told Mordechai, I just heard this recently, it's in a measure. She, she told Mordechai, why don't I wait until the king summons me? It's been a little while since he's seen me. He'll eventually want to summon me, let me just wait until he, you know, wants to see me and then I'll, I'll bring this up to him. And Mordechai said, no, you have to do it right away. And that, that another value is expediency is like, don't wait, do it now because don't give people the chance to internalize this idea that the Jewish people should be annihilated. Not, a, not a, a second should go by where, you know, people have a second more to even have to think about this. And so Esther had the courage to do something that was very risky. And to me, that was, she reflects courage in, in, in a way that I, that's hard to find today. So she's one of my, you know, role models and it's okay to have a role model who's of that caliber, you know, obviously we'll never reach that level of um, righteous. I mean, hopefully one day, but it's, it's, it's a long shot, but we try. And so the things I chose with Esther specifically were uh, courage, um, humility. And the reason I chose humility is because humility is about it not being about you, right? So humility, this is a great, I love this quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, meaning there's there's something bigger going on here, right? Just like with Sapir Cohen, this hostage, there was something bigger going on, right? And, her, and, and she didn't see it in at the time in, in the beginning of her journey of her story, but then it started to unravel. And then she started to realize, Oh, whoa, this is much bigger than me. I have a mission here. And, you know, we sometimes tend to get caught in our own 
thought patterns, you know, negative cycles and, and limiting beliefs, which are the things that hold us back from, you know, moving into our mission and finding our purpose and why we're here. And so, and humility is also, it's, it's, those are, you know, big words, but um, it's interesting to ask, like, what would, what would someone do with this? If they had this belief that this is not about me, this has nothing to do with me. This is Hashem orchestrating things. It's bigger than me. What should I do? Then there's, there's some level of clarity there that we might not have if we didn't have this amazing person in mind. Um, so the, the, the values for her, I actually just, I have it here cause I'd written it down. It's courage, humility, and expediency were the three words that came up for her. Expediency is not waiting, do it right away. There's a great, um, tip that I don't know if you're familiar with Mel Robbins. She has a, a famous podcast. Um, she's like a motivational speaker and she coined this, this five second rule. And we all use it in our family. The five second rule is essentially when you have the first thought about wanting to do something. Your brain has, your mind has five seconds to talk you out of it. So for example, you know, oh, I really want to go for a run. You've got five seconds to put, to start putting your sneakers on because otherwise your mind will convince you out of it. When you wake up in the morning, you want to get out of bed, right? Think about what happens, right? Most of us want to just hit the snooze button and go back to sleep. If you have in mind that five second rule, you've got five seconds. After the five seconds, you're on your own. And uh, if you're on your own, you're in trouble. So it, it's, that really helped me tap into the expediency thing because procrastination was one of my big struggles. I would put things off and it's still a struggle, you know, in many different areas, but I, but I'm working on it. Like this five second rule thing helps. Um, another uh, example that I heard from Dennis Prager on one of our episodes in our podcast is he said when he was a young boy, he was in yeshiva and he didn't feel like davening. And his Rebbe came to him and said, you know, why aren't you davening? And he says, because I'm not in the mood. And as Rebbe tells him, no, so what if you're not in the mood? And what does that mean? Okay, you know, you don't feel like doing it. It's not about you. You know, this is bigger than you. So even if you're not in the mood, if you know it's something that is bigger than you, it's not about you, do it. It's easier said than done. It's like Nechama, you and I were a good team because I'm a, I, I have lots of ideas percolating but it's implementation that becomes very, very difficult. And so you helped me with the accountability, expediency and getting it done. And I saw the fruits of, of that labor, right? <laughs> labor, the labor. And, um, and that you see what happens and then you, it really encourages you to continue to operate with those things in mind. I do very well with people who have genius ideas like you. <laughs> I do very well with people who are talkless oriented and get things done. <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking about how you transcended your nature based on what you just said. You know, your old self would be like, I don't ask questions. Or I don't use my voice. And here you are sharing your voice with the world and giving voice to so many others because it's about the bigger mission. And asking questions in much more intimidating circumstances where it's, this is, this is a classic turning a struggle and a challenge into an opportunity. And I, I actually had not thought of that. It was, it was in that area of being afraid to ask questions. Wow. That's and I term. said to you today, you're always asking the questions on your podcast. Today, we're going to ask you the question. <laughs> I know, you're turning it around, right? Even, yeah. So you're doing awesome. And you already really shared with us your special connection to a particular person in the Torah or subject or mitzvah. So I love how you connected to Esther. We're in Adar. Ida, I, I want to say that you truly remind me of Esther. You said it's hard to reach her caliber, but I disagree. <laughs> and as your teacher, once upon a time, I can say, and now you're my teacher, I could say to you that that is really the point of the seven voices is to let us know that <clears throat> we have their DNA in our souls and we really can achieve their greatness. And you have done that. And you are stepping into roles that go beyond your nature and everyone here, take a moment to think, how can you step into your role and wear that crown that might feel intimidating? You might feel like not worthy of it. 
take a moment to say, what if Esther would not have stepped into that moment and taken that risk or lose the chance to save her people? Ida, you are saving our people. This is not small. Like the, these kind of books, when it reaches one Jewish woman, one Jewish girl, she is a whole world. How much more when it it's here forever? So I wanted to take a, just a moment to ask Shandel, who is a woman who joined a course that I provided last year based on the seven voices for women. And recently, uh, Shandel shared with me the impact that this book had on her. And so before we get to the next question is, sharing your grow with us. This is the language, right? It's not a grow circle without sharing another, a grow. I wanted to ask Shandel, who is a huge grow pro, who's been here for two years, uses grow daily, to share how the seven voices, not just, not only impacts the girls, but I didn't know how it would reach the women. So just for a moment, a moment, uh, a little break here in the program. <laughs> okay. Hi, hi, Ida and Nechama and everyone. Good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first, I want to thank you, Ida, for sharing. Um, so uh, what I heard was that you, that it just, it was so beautiful to hear um, how you took what you could from various people and like you said, discerned what fit you and what you could use to then refine yourself. And I, I just love that because I would, I used to take everything from everybody and I couldn't figure out what was, what was good for me. And then, you know, it was theirs and uh, you really were able to explain that so, so well this morning. Thank you. So I wrote a testimonial to Nahama um, because I had an experience with the seven voices book that was significant, really significant. So I'll, I'll read it to you what I wrote. Um, I'm grateful to have had the privilege of joining Grow Zoom groups for over two years. I've been gathering my copies of many of the beautiful resources produced and available to support my Grow process. I recognize that Grow, to me, is the voice of serving Hashem with all of my heart. I feel different after I do Grow when I use it um, to work through my life's challenges. One book in particular, Seven Voices of Leadership, I had the opportunity to learn with a group of women with Nechamedina. I remember one Shabbat after attending a session, I decided to read this book cover to cover. I sat outside in my backyard and read it cover to cover. And literally, I read the very beginning page. Like the, I always read the first page of every book too, which always has so much, so much in it. Um, so it said the very first page, what is a bat mitzvah? Um, and that took me back to when I was 12 and 13 years old. Um, I grew up not religious in, um, in the Valley in LA. Um, I did not have a bat mitzvah and I was not, it was not even seen as something relevant to my maturity. It was actually scorned. <laughs> it was a very materialistic kind of, um, uh, word when you said bat mitzvah, it represented, um, materialism. Um, I started to cry and I continued reading about the incredible women of the Torah who are in our very bones, a legacy of leadership we have within, and I wanted to really connect to them. So after I finished the book, I closed it and quietly knew that I had just had my bat mitzvah. Wow. I felt oneness with my creator. And my wish is to be able to continue to learn this book with more women in groups to really feel the power and connection we have available to us. That wow. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much, Shandel. And so, Ida, if there's anything more you want to add, and then uh, share with us your grow. I love when women tell me that they write grows to each other, and it's become a language that is connecting women on a much deeper level, heart and soul. So, and I thank you for bringing the grow on another level to the idea through to grow through the trust. It's another whole level of grow. And right now I'm offering a grow mentor training to women who are going to spread the grow on all the levels, starting with the purple level, which is just based on life. And then you grow through prayer and then you grow through trust. 
And also before Pesach, I'm going to be offering a preparation to grow through your Pesach preparations with pleasure through a Haggadah journal that we also created. And uh, and then later in March, we're also doing a Build Bitachon in Business with Susan Axelrod, who is my coach and mentor who has really helped me create co-founded Jewish Girls Unite. So we want to bring Bitachon into whatever business it is. It could be our home, into our life, into our work, whatever that looks like. doesn't have to be the typical business. I know that, Ida, you're really a genius in business together with your husband. And I have I don't to know, let me correct you. My husband is a genius in business. <laughs> and thanks to right. him, I'm able to hone in on that, on the well, creativity side. But exactly. yeah, we're a good team. I mean, yeah. The good team, the good yeah. partnership. And uh, I really appreciate, I see like something special when you give an idea, the books that you have inspired, there's something magical about it. There's a bracha to it. I just want to really thank you for that. Um, they're probably my most popular sales. So, <laughs> so I really want to thank you for the constant support. And uh, now I ask you, what would you like to, um, how would you like to share or grow? And a final message, a closing message, and then we'll open up to some questions and from the audience. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I would say, uh, I just want to talk about Shara Bittachan for a minute because it's, as we know, life-changing. And the best, I would say, definition that I heard by Rabbi Shays Taub on Shara Bittachan, or I should say Bittachan, and living with a Bittachan mindset is that you're you're acting as though you have the benefit of hindsight when you don't. And what that means is you're doing what you'll say you should have done looking back, but in real time. And what that means is some of the things we mentioned before, but mainly, and I, you know, I also am an ADD, I was an ADD coach and I, I, I happen to have a diagnosis myself. And I think the biggest challenge that people have, I would say women, cause I work primarily with women and what I found fascinating was this wasn't just women with ADD. This was almost all women I spoke to was closing the knowing and doing gap. So most people know what they could be and should be doing in order to grow and to become um, more joyful. And we know that if Hashem commanded us to be joyful, specifically now in the month of Adar, and now we have two months to do it, because, to hone in on it, because we have two Adars this year. If Hashem gave us this opportunity and this, I should say this commandment, then there's no doubt that we we can be joyful in our day to day life every day. And being joyful doesn't mean that we're always you know chipper and happy, and it doesn't mean that we're you know we have less toxic positivity, which is a whole nother a whole other subject in and of itself. But it just means that we we recognize that everything Hashem does is good, and even if we don't see the good, we experience it in a way where we just realize we don't see the full picture. And there are many veils, there are many limitations that we have. We all know that we don't see everything that's there. There's actually this museum here in Miami called the Paradox Museum. It's fascinating. It's like you're looking at it, but it's not really there. It's like a, it's like a, an optical illusion. So it's kind of like a mental optical illusion, mental illusion where we think we see, but we don't. And um, so having Bittachin is acknowledging, first of all, that we don't have the big picture and um, that we we're acting as though we have the benefit of hindsight when we don't. And what that means, and for me, it meant like, I'm not, um, I'm not, a, I don't, I'm not a lecturer per se. Like I like to have conversations. And so, but I really wanted to start doing a Shara Bittachin sort of class, mainly to keep me accountable because one way I close the knowing and doing gap, right? Which is what I know I need to do, but I don't do it is to have a commitment. So I do this with exercise as well. I don't think I'll ever be, well, I shouldn't say that because you never know, but I have a hard time, you know, being accountable to myself when it comes to exercise and workouts. So I schedule a, a, a class that I have to pay for. It's non-refundable. And so I know I'm going to go because I don't want to lose my deposit. I don't want to lose my money. I want to I get my money's worth. So I go. And so I like to do the same thing with Shara Bittachin. So what we did was I, I scheduled a class and I made it a learning group because I'm not, you know, I, I wasn't so comfortable being in the teacher's seat, especially because, and what I find time and time again, is that when I do these types of, of uh, you know, uh, lectures, I find that so many of the people I speak to should be in the teacher's chair. 
Like there's so many incredible women right here who could, and I should, I, I'll say should be doing exactly what I'm doing right now or something similar. And so one way that I was able to, you know, overcome a, a challenge, which the challenge was, you know, wanting to give the class, but not feeling ready because I'm not, I don't know Shara Bittachin well enough to be able to give a class is that I, I did a learning group. I got a couple women together and we sit down and we read through the Shara Bittachin text and we discuss concepts and ideas. And it's, it's been incredible. So we all can do something like that, right? It doesn't require, look, but it requires even, commitment. Yeah, it's commitment. Exactly. I want to share with you, there's a, Razy is on here. She came on special because she's very inspired by you and uses the Grow Trust Planner with an accountability partner daily. And I am witness to it because my daughter is her partner. <laughs> and she would like to just stop you here and share something about exactly what you're saying. I'm going to add you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to start off by saying thank you for everything you've shared already today, but um, even more so everything that you did to make this Grow Planner happen. Um, it's something that really has transformed my life. We're, I think we're around 40 days in. Um, and, you know, learning about Bitachin throughout the years is is, you know, beautiful. Um, but this is something that's so broken down. I have an accountability, as you said, like into action every day. I have my 1230 alarm that goes off time to call and, um, we give it no more than 15 minutes so that it's doable. Um, and it's, it's such bite-sized pieces to break it down in the grow, um, format. So we have, um, real, you know, bites that we're walking away with and thinking about for the next 24 hours until we get to the next tidbit um, of bitachin. Um, and I've definitely felt its impact in a way that any other time I learned bitachin, you know, a small sicha here or there, it doesn't impact in the same way as when it's consistent. Um, I think bitachin is something that has to permeate. And I'm so grateful that I have the Grow Planner to help do that. So thank, oh, Razie, you. thank you for sharing that. I love that you said bite-sized because that's really what it's all about. It's like you make it, you know, bite-sized enough where you know you could do it. So there's no way of getting out of it. And I love that you set an alarm too. That's really great. Yeah. Keep yeah. growing. Unbelievable. It's Razy and Hannah, you know, day 111. By then we're all going to dance at your weddings because 101 is like oneness on all levels. <laughs> so. Hashem should bless everyone here with everything you need in total oneness with Hashem. Because really, bitachon comes from the word tach, which is plaster. It's that feeling and embodiment of oneness with Hashem, which you have brought to us in such a practical way, Ida, today. So now um, I invite you, Ida, to share a grow. And that unites all of us here, speaking the language of tefillah. And um, and then before we have questions, we have also Susan that wants to share something right after your grow. Okay. Okay. So the first is gratitude, right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So uh, I'm sharing what I'm grateful for, right? Exactly. Okay. So grow is always personal. Like you're speaking from yourself. It's first person. Okay. So I am grateful um, to have found a meaningful uh, and impactful mission that I can use and and share with with others and uh i'm grateful to be able to share my skills and talents with others and enhance and enrich their lives and also enrich my own in the process okay, okay. Uh, uh recognition recognition yeah <laughs> okay so so recognition is can you define it like how we're gonna share it here okay so recognize how are you using those talents Okay, you know, so, scared, but you can go into the details a bit more. Okay, so I recognize that to uh, work through the mission and to keep doing what I'm doing, it involves sometimes being uncomfortable and um, it's par and parcel. And, but I know I'm doing Hashem's work. And so I embrace that discomfort. I love how you recognize Hashem because that's part of the recognition. And one thing I will say is we're in the mentor training. I'm sharing how sometimes we're not ready to say, I recognize Hashem. That's okay. The first step is just bringing consciousness and awareness. 
So it could be, I recognize I'm really feeling lousy. That's it. <laughs> I'm recognizing that I want to feel better. And then the next day, and then the oneness would be, so what am I going to do about it? What do I need? I'm curious and I'm compassionate to myself in the process. I don't always need to like be in that recognition of life is so perfect today. It's okay. Sometimes people think that, you know, recognition means that I always see God's goodness. Sometimes I don't. But what happens is when you do a grow every day, you start to see the connection that the next day I, I, I'm already being lifted because of that lousy feeling, because I was in awareness of it. So now we're going to come back to you and say, so the oneness would be, what is your next step? What are your future goals? How do you want to continue to grow? And it could be a small goal, a small step, even for today. I would say to harness the power of bitachin. That is beautiful. And, and I also bitachin, you know, not it's, I, I think you made a good point, Nahama, that not everyone is going to be able to connect through picking up a Shara B'Tachain book. It doesn't really often start that way. It didn't start that way for me. I, in fact, I picked it up a little less than two years ago. So the first, you know, 30, 30 some years of my journey, I didn't know it existed. And so it's just about doing something that helps you connect to your, you know, your inner self, your truth something, anything. Yeah. And that's the personal connection with Hashem. I always, I didn't understand Bitachon really till I did this. And I, now I understand it so differently. It's being authentic with Hashem. So when somebody says, I'm so upset, I don't have Bitachon. I say, that's awareness and that's right. okay. Don't right, be upset exactly. that you're upset. <laughs> so, um, and the wish is, can be connected to the oneness. So what is your wish from Hashem in order to continue to grow your trust and fulfill your mission that is so vital to all of us? I wish that Hashem will show me the open and revealed good in uh, in every experience I have so I can understand um, his ways. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Do you in see real the time. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing and growing with us today and empowering all of us to have the courage to step into our mission and to be the Queen Esthers of 2024, 5784. Yeah. Welcome Susan Axelrod, who's a confidence coach who really loves the Bitachon. She's always called herself the confidence coach, which is another definition for Bitachon. So Susan would like to share something about that. Oh, good. And I'm already, for those of you who saw me, before I, I feel like I'm already going to cry again, you know, years ago, Nahama and I created a safe space to calm where emotion was allowed, uh, really trusting and believing that the soul is showing up when we, you know, when we cry. So anyway, Ida, hey, 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 it's good honey, to meet you. You have no idea, you know, I was in the background. I don't know. I was in the background of all this, um, all those years ago, when I remember, you know, the stories, oh my gosh, Ida's going to do this. And, you know, the year was 2019, 2019. And I just want to tell you, and every person here, there's so much to say. I just want to say this, this, this is what I'm moved and inspired to say. In 2019, I was like, oh, darn, that's ridiculous. I can't believe she's going to do this. She's going to sponsor this book. And then Nahama goes to work, you know, makes it all happen. And I watched that too. But I never imagined, uh, imagined, never imagined in my future that I would ever be able to sponsor my own book. And um, I told the story of that a few weeks ago, and I wanted to say today um, that these books, I went, I just ran and grabbed just two of them. The reason I came in, you know, I told my story, losing my husband, et cetera, and so forth. But the reason I came in to sponsor my own book 
was because of these books with that that talked about it and what you did, Ida, in those days. I I really truly mean that the evolution of for me JGU growing into the Grow uh, Connection Network and Hashem putting me in a situation that was ridiculous that traumatic that led to my ability to now be a sponsor in memory of my husband uh, for another book. Um, this is a kind of leadership I want to say to everyone here. Razi, I listened to you. I'm so loving it. My whole work is based on accountability. And for you, uh, Razi, yourself to imagine you could sponsor a book in the future, even though that may seem ridiculous to you now, to anyone here, this is the work. The books survive. Our texts survive. Uh, in Bitachon, uh, you know, you, you can't imagine if you don't have it. But, Ida, when you said, you know, believe it, act as if you believe it, act in such a way, and then Hashem provides. So, Ida, I'm grateful to you for your giving leadership. These organizations, the work that Nahama does, it requires support. So, Ida, I'm grateful to you for your giving leadership. I recognize at that moment, whatever you did at that time may or may not have been easy. And you may or may not have had any idea what would come of it. I recognize you did that anyway. You did it in uh, support of your daughter's bat mitzvah, but that was just one small angle who knew what would come of that. And in oneness with Hashem, I'm asking everyone here to follow the leadership in whatever way you can, in whatever way you can. And then I wish uh, for you, Ida, uh, continued strength, um, perseverance, courage, and a rising confidence uh, in trust that you are really strongly on the path that is intended. And, um, and I will stay tuned uh, through Nahama and through this platform. Um, I've listened to your podcasts as well, um, that you should um, grow in, in strength, from strength to strength. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I mean, I know that Susan uses the Grow Trust Planner with her clients too. Wow. Wow. That's incredible, Susan. And your yeah. words are so beautiful. I, I want to come to your workshop. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Okay. I'm there. <laughs> come to our Build Vitachan and Business. <laughs> if Susan's giving it, I'll be there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're doing it. Okay. okay awesome. Right. Love so to excited. have you. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so we're opening up the floor. I think somebody said they had a question. Um, who said they have a question? Was it Karen Miller? I actually also messaged Ed Lover. Oh, Ed Varlea. Okay, you're first. But if Karen wants, it was, I don't know who's, does Karen want to go? Okay, so um, I was so inspired by everyone speaking. Uh, wow, I have so much to say. And Susan, you just, you really, spoke to my heart I love the way you said like you don't know what you're going to do in the future just so it's such a beautiful way I have a sign in my room that says instead of being afraid of what could happen be excited about what could happen to you know oh, and um Ida I loved so much of what you said today um I agree that like there's different for me what I took was that there's different seasons like for different messages and like not all of them go like sometimes it's you don't have to wait for that heck yes to to run and then sometimes actually it's not for you and you have to like the the, the self control is what's needed and um as someone with adhd i i really re love that five minute rule my five second not five minutes my husband was there and i'm like hello listen listen both of us <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for those words of wisdom and I actually i wanted to show everybody i have these gate of trust cards and i always joke that they're my blues annex i read them they're my blue men, uh, tranquilizers. I have one on every counter. My kids know like this is, I, I don't even have credit cards. Sometimes I have these. I'm like, this is my credit card. They have like the seven. It's from Gate of Trust. It's the, um, it has seven um, 
affirmations like, gosh, God loves me. God is with me wherever I happen to be. And I give them out to everybody. And wow. I bought a thousand, I bought a thousand recently. I have like stacks around my house and I just have them in the car and just, um, so I had a question. Sure. I re- really, what you spoke about listening to my intuition and not, and, you know, choosing, I have like a thousand ideas in my head and then I get tired and don't want to do any. And, um, I just, I'm wondering how, how to listen to which one I want to do first. I, I, I was literally, I, I can't believe how this class, I wasn't expecting this. And I was like, go on, can you come on today? And I'm like, I would love to. And I heard you were speaking and I love the way you talk. And, um, it was a great, first of all, that explanation about Esther, mind blown. Thank you for that midrash. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm I'm in that place where I don't know where to start and not even sure if this is, if those, if I should, if it's maybe just like, I don't know which side it's coming from. If it's ego, if it's, you know, I want to start a, um, a clothing. I started with my cousin, a clothing free for women in Florida just all beautiful clothing. And then I want to start acupuncture for women that want to get, you know, all these ideas. And then I'm like, I have to take care of my family and myself. And um, I know like this is a special time. So it's just, um, my question is, how do you sift? And I okay. agree with you. The moment to moment is like the best. It's Gula, moment to moment, discernment. I love that. But I'm look, I don't know. It's hard to know some days. Right. Yes. You know, yeah. You and, have, and also something you make of, commitments yeah. and you make commitments. I'm like, I can't make commitments if I'm going to be choosing moment to moment. So how do you balance that? Right. So you highlighted something very, very important. And that is that moment to moment um, requires something essential as a prerequisite. And that is a values, bigger picture driven, um, you know, uh, decision-making process. So it's not just moment to moment, because if it was just moment to moment, we'd all be in trouble. And so I'll tell you how I do it, because I think it, I could only speak to my own experience because I can very much relate to everything that you said. I was and am a person of ideas. If you ask my husband, he'll tell you like, literally like probably once a day, I'll come up with something, you know, that I want to do. Open a restaurant, this, that, literally (laughs) anything you write. Anything you could think of, I've I thought of maybe one day doing. And so what steered me in in uh in I guess, and I don't, I don't want to say one direction because it's interesting that this is how I started, meaning I was in this place where I had all these ideas and nothing was happening. So and then when I started to read about channeling your your um your weaknesses into strengths and learning opportunities and all of that, that's when I launched multi-role woman. So multi-role woman was literally driven by this desire to do many different things Mm. um, because I had many different, like, I guess, skills, talents, and I didn't know which way to go. So I started with this whole idea that we're dynamic people. So I'm reframing this being scattered to being dynamic, right? We have all these different, different ways um, of being, and, and most women are multi-role women. We have, we're being pulled in so many directions. You know, we don't know what will happen from today, you know, to tomorrow. And so that was the first part for me was just mentally getting myself to shift my focus and my attitude to, from, from like this negative attitude about, oh my gosh, I'm so scattered. I can't figure things out to, no, I'm dynamic. I have so many, I have so much to offer. I just need to find direction. So that was the first step. The second step was actually something that uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs said to us in in an interview, which has stuck with me until today. And I use it all the time. And he says, um, and if you've listened to the podcast, you probably heard this. He said, if you want to find your purpose, you think about the following statement. It's where what you want to do meets what needs to be done. So what does that look like in, in life? For me, it was, okay, so I want to do this, right? For example, I want to start a podcast. Okay, um, let's just take that first step, right? That, um, that what was the word raisey you I think it was raisey who said the bite size bite size thank you yeah that take a little bite right so you're you're test you're putting your foot in the water you're not jumping in you're you're testing it out so let's say with the uh okay I wanted to go back to school I, that was one of the things I wanted to do I wanted to get educated and uh so I 
I wanted to go to college. This was back when I had two kids and my youngest was a year old. So I took a placement test. It didn't, wasn't a big cost, right? It didn't cost anything. In fact, it was at a community college in Ohio where we lived at the time. I took a placement test. I figured, let me see where I go from here. Now, what ends up happening is, and anyone who knows the term stacking habits, right? It's this great book that I recommend called Atomic Habits. Essentially, it says that when you start one thing, like mitzvah, gairis, mitzvah, like one thing leads to another. So once I already had my foot in the door, it's like putting your sneakers on and then you go outside, then you're running once you're outside with your sneakers on. So um, that's what I did. I went to school and then I took one class and then another. And granted, I want to just acknowledge that not everyone might have the opportunity to do something like that because of the all, all the other demands that they have. But I'm saying, take your life experience and you know just look at it, step back, look at it, or seek mentorship. If you have someone you know, in your family or a friend, just run by them what you want to do. Like, I want to do this, I want to do that. What do you think? Because usually other people are better judges than we are of our capabilities, what we should do, which direction we should go in. Um, so for me, it was first mentally reframing my experience from I'm scattered, I just, I'm, I'm all over the place to I'm dynamic, I'm just finding direction and I have a lot to offer. I'm just finding my way. That was the first thing. The second thing was testing the waters, trying this, trying that. Um, and then the, the third thing was really, it's really a prerequisite also, was when you know what's important. So for me, it was like, I, I knew that I wanted to be present for my family because I knew that anytime I was present with my family, I had a certain sense of peace and joy internally. And I knew that that was where Hashem wanted to be because I'm not replaceable as, as a wife and mother. So I had to make sure that, and that's why we're doing this in real time, like a chess game. It's like, okay, you know, I, I had this commitment. Now my daughter called from school because, you know, she's not feeling great. I have to go pick her up. What should I do? Right. So it was like, a con it's, it's also constantly making, so in that regard, it's, you're doing this, you're doing this in real time. You're making the decision um, as the opportunity comes based on what's going on in your life at the time. I think you mentioned like that it depends what season you are in your life, right? So, okay, just to hone in and clarify, it's remember this is this is actually a, 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 a opportunity to challenge that what might be a perceived weakness. The second thing is try one thing, maybe something that speaks to you more with a small commitment, a bite-sized, you know, action, and then test the water, like see what happens. See, like, you know, you're going to recalibrate, see what happens. And eventually it's sort of like there might be some detours, but if you're working in the direction and we're so lucky to have Hashem, you know, and, and for me, Shara B'Tachayin really gives me a sense of direction and helps me, you know, like get clarity on, on whether I'm going in the right direction or whether I need to um, shift a little bit. Ida, I'm jumping out of my seat here because you're describing my process and how one move led to the next move. And I could never imagine actually being here. And I wanna say that it's really thanks to Susan for 10 years we've been working together and we meet weekly. In the beginning, we used to meet daily because there was so much and now it's weekly and that's exactly what we do. It's like, what needs to get done and what's the next step? What needs to get, what needs to happen to get to the next step? I would never be here. This is not magic. I make it look very easy. But really, it's sometimes I come with too many ideas. I'm that kind of person. I totally relate. And Susan will be like, well, how many things do you think you could do? <laughs> you got to hone in here. <laughs> so if not for that, I would be all over the place. So that is really why I want to share my experience. as a, and, and it's a gift that Susan is giving to all of us to join us and to give this to many more women. And Ija, I really want you to be there with us guiding women too. I see this vision, you and Susan will be answering questions like Devorah Leah, and you cannot do this alone. I could not do it alone. I would not be here if I did this alone. So I'm going to invite you to integrate Bitachon into this format of being emotional, we can be real, we can talk about our fears and our obstacles and where we feel stuck, but at the same time, draw in the inspiration from Hashem and from the bigger picture. 
and then also have accountability and bring it down to the profit as well so that we're not just doing spinning our wheels, but we're also supporting our families and our bigger picture lives. So I invite you all to join. We're starting mid-March. The exact date is March 11th or the next. We're meeting every other week on Monday nights. This way we have time to implement in the in between and you also get support in between. So it's at my website, growconnectionnetwork.com, build bitachon in business. Don't be afraid of the word business. Women, I find are afraid of that word, but really our lives should be run as a business, organized with goals, with strategies, um, and of course with trust in Hashem. So Ida, I'm gonna talk to you about that because I feel that you have something that you can add to it. You have uh, so much experience and expertise in so many areas, um, and I have mine. And so even if women are involved with nonprofits, you will benefit, or even if it's just your home or an idea like Dvorlea is talking about, <laughs> and breaking it down so that it becomes actionable and practical. Thank you so much. I, I must go, but thank you. People are asking me for the link. Is it okay if I send it to Nahama and then you'll send it out? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, Susan, thank you, Ida, for your time. I really appreciate it. Nice all the you. best. It was great. It was a great answer. I wrote it all down. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Okay, good. Yeah. Devor, um, Devor, uh, Karen. So Karen is coming on from Israel. She runs Lev Ha'am. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for this amazing um, meeting here in Hama, amazing grow, amazing circle of women, always inspiring us. I actually just made a comment. Maybe you need to be the next Wonder Woman and we get to ask you questions how you got here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this was really amazing. Um, very, um, very much mechazic, like really to hear somebody and to hear your journey and how authentic you are and genuine you shared so much with us. And I, I totally relate. Like, you know, you have all these ideas and you want to get somewhere. And it was very good. I wrote notes, notes actually on what you just answered, Dvorlea. So I really appreciate it. And um, what do you think, I'm just thinking now out loud, like what do you think helped you to be able to get to this stage of where you, where you are now? Because you had mentioned that you have ADD and you weren't the best student and, you know, things happen along the journey. Of course, you're a mom also. So what was it that you know helped you to sort of stabilize all those ideas and really get to where you're at today? I mean, you're a psychotherapist, you've, you've done a lot, Baruch Hashem, and you look quite young. Okay, so that's a good question. Um, and I think in every stage of life, it was a little different, but I would say the main thing is support uh, from my family, from my husband, even from my kids and them being, um, you know, proud to watch me learn and step out of my comfort zone, involving them in the process. Um, what else helped me? Taking care of myself. I think that I, I don't think I know. I started out um, being more in this mode of taking care of others at the expense of myself. And I think that ended up draining me, even though I was doing such good things, I realized that Hashem wants us to take care of our minds and our bodies first and foremost, so that we can be more equipped and ready to take care of others. So if that means we have to let go of certain things, like making sure our house is always clean or, you know, always, or always saying yes to certain things. I think the most important thing for me was learning to take care of my, my physical health, my mental health, making sure even to eat breakfast, I'm not a breakfast person. And, um, you know, I, I just, this one little snippet that I saw this video where I think it was Jordan Peterson who said, you don't like to eat breakfast, similar to Dennis Prager. Um, so what if you don't like to eat breakfast? It doesn't matter what you want. It matters what is needed from you in order to feel energized to take on the day. So um, taking care of myself was very important and having the support of family and being able to be vulnerable and ask for help because that's another very difficult thing for me to do um, and still is in a way. So those are three things I would say. Yeah, that helped. Is that okay? Is that today? Back to the basics, you know, sometimes. That was okay. great. That was great. Thank you so much. Okay. And Karen, by the way, also I sent 
several books, Grow Trust Planners for Women in Israel and Beit Shemesh, and Karen teaches Bitachon to women. Oh, I want to add one thing, of course, and Nechama, the Grow Trust Planner, that the journaling is huge. I mean, that can, people underestimate its value. And I know this is said so often, like journal, journal but it really, really is huge. And uh, even the Rebbe talked about this, like even writing a, you know, uh, uh, is that the word, just writing things down. Sometimes in our minds, it's not clear. And when you put it on a paper, it brings so much clarity. And I would strongly recommend, this is something anyone can do, is in the morning or in the evening, it should take five minutes and write out what you're grateful for. And this, the Grow Planner is a fabulous, fabulous tool for, for doing that. I agree with that one. I just want to tell you something about what you mentioned before with the Shara Bitachon, because I do teach it. And the reason I teach is because I wanted to learn it. So it's like you, when you started the group, and I don't agree with you that you can't teach it. You, you're teaching it by doing it in a Chabura. You're doing it together with other women. And I think everyone here has that potential. People think that, oh, I, I never taught before. I don't know Hebrew so well. Today, there's so many resources and everything is in English and there's Mepharshim, you know, different explanations. And I think everyone here can do the same thing, you know, just gather a few friends together and be able to learn it together. And it says, we say it in the brachos of the Shema, Limod ulelamed. that's our job. We have to learn like we do with Nechama and then give it over. Because everybody has to shine their light, I feel. And you know, so, it's very uh, true. Kala Kavod that. that you did, by the way. Kala Kavod that you took the steps to even to implement it, even though you didn't feel like you could teach it. And thank it's you for, very, you just reframe that for me. Thank you for doing that too. It's like we teach that which we need to learn. And uh, uh, yeah, so it's not that I didn't feel that I could teach it. It was just that I taught what I knew and we developed a core, a class. And and um, yeah, thank you for that. Is that the class with Devorah and Juzier? So that's a class I go to. So what we did in, in Bell Harbor here is that we, I'm hopefully trying to to help start this movement where anyone in that class, like we're six or seven people and each person is going to start their own learning group. So we're going to pay it forward. And hopefully at a certain point, everybody's going to be teaching something to someone because everyone can do it. That's the thing is like, if I, I keep saying, if I could do it, anyone could do it. Really, I believe that. that. That's our mission and to provide the resources to make it very easy to be a teacher. So the Grow Trust Planner is a ready to go resource for someone who can't, let's say, I don't, this is too much to read, complicated, or you read a little bit and that bite sized pieces, really it leads to discussion where everyone becomes the teacher and the student. So that is the goal. That's why right now I'm training people to be Grow Mentors and use all these resources. Um, and so next week, by the way, Devorah and Juzi is our Wonder Woman. So you see one move leads to the next. I connected wow. with her to give her the planner. And now she's going to be speaking about her Batachon journey next Wednesday. I, I strongly recommend that everyone comes. She's really incredible. She's an amazing teacher. Wow. Yeah. So everyone in the chat, if you could write one takeaway in oneness with Hashem, one Take away, how are we going to strengthen our trust in Hashem? The Baal Shem Tov teaches that we need to pray to strengthen our trust in Hashem. Prayer leads to action. So what is one thing we can all walk away with today? We're all so inspired by you, Ida. And really, it helps me see people differently because I never had trouble seeing the goodness in you. That's the truth. When you talk about yourself that way, I never saw that. So I never saw you. I always saw like this refined, a real refined person. You were always very respectful and you just had something very magical. I, like I said in the beginning, like you, you shone, but I knew that, you know, there was so much more inside of you that you weren't showing us. And I'm so glad that you're, you're stepping into the role and revealing yourself and who you truly are. And uh, like somebody told my daughter, Hannah, recently, it's not fear to us if you don't share your art with the world, because she sometimes holds back. And people said, it's not fear to you us, because every person here is God's sanctuary, just like we read in the Parsha. And I can't enter God's sanctuary if you're not going to open your doors and allow Hashem's light to shine through you. And every person has a different light of Hashem that we bring to the world. So we are all here basking in the light of Hashem that he's given to you that you've worked so hard to reveal in yourself. 
And through that, many more women will also discover that inner light in their right. own challenge and in themselves. One more thing that Rabbi Sack shared that I want to share is he said that, and this is from his own experience, uh, not wanting to initially be a rabbi, he wanted to be a, an academic. He said the most transformative moments in a person's life happen when someone believes in them more than they believe in themselves. And you know what you were saying about me not seeing it, but you seeing it, that's exactly what that is because our own self-imposing limiting beliefs can really, you know, hinder us from, from stepping into our purpose. And so I'm going to say here that I believe in you and I believe in every one of you here. And I know that you have tremendous power and potential, which you probably already used just by being there, by being here and just continue to harness that. And I, I really am so grateful to be here and to be a part of this and you know, wow. hopefully we'll all grow from here, continue to Amen. grow. Amen. We have one action here. Ahuva says she wants to start a group in Chicago with the Grow Trust Planner. Amazing. And Ahuva has been at, at our Grow programs for mo more than two years. Susan, go ahead. Say um, to everyone here something Nahama knows we worked on so many years ago, and that is what Ida just revealed to us was that she has a class where she is. She didn't say there's 600 people in the class. She didn't say there's 60 people in the class. She said there's six or seven. I call this enoughness. This lesson that you share with us today, that you uh, see the success and the um, impact from having a class with six or seven people in it, is such uh, such an important lesson in this world there's so muchness so muchness there needs to be so many so many so many uh, but yet in those days it was you know me and nahama two little tiny people you know and so on and so forth along the way and so i really hope every person is listening to this today and like really clear uh on this one class that you said you talked about with six or seven people is so much more than enough it's so good. It's such a success. It's not a failure because there were only six people in the class. Every one of those people, as Nechama just said before, is an entire universe. Thank and you. Even I, even just one, like a bit, call it a bitachon buddy, like Rezi and Hana. I'm That's I'm it. so glad that you shared that specifically one because my my podcast partner Rivka Krinsky, her grandfather was Chaim Gutnik, and he he was sent to Australia to be the emissary for the Jewish community there. The Rebbe told him to arrange a class on uh, Tahara Samishbacha, family purity. And he rented a hall and he set up, you know, tons of chairs. And one person came, one person showed up and he kind of felt bad not giving the class. So he gave the class to this woman and we, he went to the Rebbe after and he told the Rebbe, you know, you told me to do this and there was only one person there. You know, why is that? And the Rebbe said, my Sherebenu only had one mother. And that was just such an aha moment. One person, one person, forget six, it's one. And and even if it's even if it's sitting down with, with yourself, the relationship you have with yourself, even if no one comes, it's it's huge. Thank you, you know, so now, much for sharing that. Thank you. And you know now how I'm very into bringing tefillah to the world and into schools and groups. Really, it started because Susan and her friend Debbie wanted to learn about prayer. And we started on Adobe Connect in 2015 <laughs> before we had the advantage of, of Zoom. And that just grew into this and bringing tefillah into the world in a meaningful way. And I'm really humbled that I've just said yes to it. I People say, how did you come up with it? I say, I don't really know. That's Hashem. <laughs> you can ask him. I just said yes to being his channel. And thank you, Ida, for saying yes. And everyone here contributes your part to build Hashem's Mishkan. And either through our resources, through philanthropy, which you offer to the Jewish Girls Unite Grow Connection Network community, through giving your time, through teaching, whatever we have, everyone take a moment to do a grow. Say thank you, Hashem, for my mission, my soul. I recognize what I have to give my resources, my voice matters. The world needs it. It's not fair if you don't share it. <laughs> it's not fair to all of us. And in oneness with Hashem, he's my partner. 
That's why I can do it. I can go beyond my nature, as we have heard from Ida today. And I wish for all of us to shine our light because when each person steps into their crown, we will have the crown of Mashiach. And so uh, we oh, have... Okay, so... Wow, thank you everyone for your feedback, for your comments, for your questions, for your participation, for being here. And each of you is just really a beautiful light. I wanna welcome, and actually I didn't welcome anyone here and personally in our smaller groups, we do that. And everyone does get to have a chance to speak and share their grows. Wednesdays is a different format. And I also um, wanna say thank you to my mother, Mrs. Katzenberg, who came on. And it's through my mother that I know you, Ida, that I moved to Montreal. So <laughs> recognize that. And um, yeah, just take a moment to say thank you, Hashem, for this time together. Thank you, Hashem, for Nechama's mother bringing such a special Nechama into the world. Yes. yes. <laughs> She's still here? Yeah. Thank you, Ma. Hi, Ima. Are you there? <laughs> Ima, Ima, of course. Ima Labor. She has a big Ima, support. not Ima Labor. Ima, Ima Katzenberg. <laughs> Ima. Thank I you, Summer, It's quite amazing. So clear and useful. Everything was like really, really like precision perfect. We could take these tools and just use them, walk away with them and put them right to work. And I think that was a really amazing feature of, of the Edith's talk also among among lots <laughs> thank you thank yeah you. thank you for making it so real and practical and actionable actionable okay anyone else here want to write any takeaways too many takeaways to I mean, i'm sorry i haven't been looking at the chat because it's it would have um distracted me but i will check it out now after the class and hopefully i'll send you all the comments yeah okay <laughs> and it will be on youtube so many people have asked about the recording so i know this is a very popular segment and Ray Shigala, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask one. you one quick thing um first of all you had so much wisdom and so much um that you gave to us and your confidence is so it's a it's a special kind of confidence that you have it's a humble confidence that you don't see in many people it's really really special sure. i just wanted to ask you it was kind of a, a step after karen's question about your children sometimes you know you you were telling us about the discernment that we listen to certain voices and then we have to plug out those voices sometimes keep different things they say you know, while we're doing this and we're growing ourselves and we're parenting ourselves, you have children in the middle of all this and we have children. And so how do you take that step while that's happening with the children and you're growing and then they're growing? And then you made you told us an example that you used about the five second rule. Um, I'm thinking that your authenticity with them, that you're authentic, that if there's a mistake. But I just wanted to know if you could give us a few examples. Um, you know, when we feel that we are still growing, how do we, how do we incorporate that so that we don't make those mistakes with them? Or maybe that's not the right word. That's a great that's question. Fun. That's a great question. So um, I'll you. share. Yeah, of course. And thank you for the beautiful compliment. And um, it really means a lot. So um, Edith Eager, who wrote a book called The Choice, she's a Holocaust survivor. I oh, highly yeah. recommend that book. She said, well, first of all, she said, you know, children do what we do. They don't do what we say. So I think that we have to acknowledge that we're all on a growth journey. You know, we're, hopefully we never reach our destination because we're always growing, right? There's always that next, um, you know, uh, next goal that we want to continue to, we, we want to continue to grow essentially. And I think when our kids are watching us work on ourselves, it gives them permission to do the same. Where I find sometimes it gets difficult is being able to um, pull apart our inner child from our adult self. And sometimes I see that parents are um, trying to maybe take their, and, and I'm going to say this in a way that might sound negative, but it's not, um, to take their unfinished business and project it onto their children. And I think what's so crucial is that 
we let our kids find their way. We're just guides. We're, you know, we're not telling them what to do and where to go. We're, I mean, granted, I'm not talking about like toddlers. I'm saying once they have the capacity, you know, for rational thinking and they can make decisions on their own and learn from them, I think it's important that um, first they can, they watch us right? But we're accountable. Like we're, we need to ask ourselves, okay, am I triggered because of my inner child, right? Who feels insecure or is it the adult in me? Well, if it's a trigger, it's probably the inner child, but you know, we want to be able to come from a place of intention. So for example, um, you know, let's say my child comes home and um, doesn't do her homework, right? You know, am I going to force my child's pen into, into her hand and say, do, you can't really do that. What you could do is you could say, well, first of all, I, I don't like to do my homework. So I totally get that feeling of not wanting to. Um, but there are, you know, there are consequences to that. And obviously you want to set your child up for success, right? In their environment. But at the same time, you really want them to learn from from their own thing, from their own decisions. And um, I think that when we're too much, and I'm speaking from my own experience, when, when we, we're too much in like, I know better than you mode, mm -hmm. We're depriving our children of a crucial, crucial tool that they need in their life, in their adult life. They have to be able to make decisions and understand consequences in a, obviously a safe way. And um, so for me, it's like at a certain point, like my when my daughter was younger, she had a hard time waking up for, you know, for school, it's hard for her to get up in the morning as it is for most of us. And uh, so, but I just... I wanted her to set her her own alarm. And then I thought, you know what? Even if it means one day she'll miss the bus, you know, instead of me going in every day and knocking and banging on the door and saying, get up, get up, then maybe I can allow her to have that learning experience. It's just one small example, but I also feel it transfers that- to tell, It transfers over from somebody pounding at you and like, oh my, you know, my mom is such a pain in the neck, what does she want from me? To guess what? I, I have responsibility for this. My teacher will dock me, my teacher will this. I did that all the time in my record, in my um, book that I that I made the grades. There was a grade for everything, the homework, the attendance, how late you were. And after a while, they're like, well, why? I'm like, well, let me show you, here it is. And then they got it. But you know, people have to get it on their own, regardless of their age. Exactly, you said it perfectly. That's exactly right. Um, that's, and then another thing that, this is, I'm not perfect. And I actually had a conversation a couple of uh, weeks ago with a good friend of mine. I told her, we were talking about parenting. And I said, I try to not do things that I know my kids could do on their own. Like for example, uh, pack their lunch. So my kids were packing their lunches in kindergarten. Um, obviously my, I was overlooking it to make sure they were packing actual food and not just candy, but um, I was trying. And she, so she tells me, wow, they do their own laundry. It's like, actually, no, they don't. They don't do their own laundry. So I'm still working on this. Like, it would be great if they did, they all did their own laundry. So, you know, I'm not a perfect parent, but I try to let them navigate life um, in a way that is good for their own, you know, internal and experience. And it's not always easy. It's not always easy. And I'm not, I'm, I'm far from a perfect parent, but um, those are the things I learned is really to let them go through their process and be there as a guide and a source of support without having to, you know, breathe down their throat and tell them everything that you think they should do. Well, responsibility is also not necessarily that somebody does everything, like maybe at a certain stage of a kid's life, part of their main responsibility to themselves is not doing laundry. You know, maybe there are other things that are more important for them to develop and grow at that, at that point in their lives. So it also has to be to the person's level. Exactly. Thank you for adding that. Exactly. You're exactly right. Yes. Sounds like Ida, you're very good at that. <laughs> really being strategic about your children's growth. I know even just the fact that you care, we're never going to get it perfect, but you're in awareness. That's step one. And then let Hashem inspire the rest. It's I very hard for me actually to not, because I became a therapist. It was hard. And my, my daughter actually called me out on this. She said, she, she said something like, you're talking like a therapist once. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have to really take my therapist hat off mm -hmm. when I get home. And, and it's, you know, when you, you know, like, I know what to do. Like I know the best thing you could do in this circumstance, but to hold back is very difficult. That's a challenge for me. 
So it's like a balancing act. It's funny because somebody, so asked, somebody asked if you welcome. have any challenges today. <laughs> like, so that is, that's a good, good example of a challenge. You know, sometimes <clears throat> it's like, yeah, when you become a coach or your kids don't, they don't want to hear you you know, grow them. Like my kids don't want me to grow them and tell them. So really it's up to me to just live it for myself. And then they're going to learn from me. I heard a great tip once where someone said, um, you can ask your child, do you want me to give you advice or would you prefer if I just listened and, you know, just heard you out so I could be a sounding board. So That's what I that. do. That's what I do with my, I mean, my daughter is 26, but I'm wow. in I'm in, I'm in awe of you because I was 19 when I had her and I was still growing up and um, I'm just in awe of your constant awareness. I have ADHD like you and you're able to take this awareness and um, what I'm most in awe of people that are, don't even know how amazing they are. And you're sitting here and you keep telling us tools and everything and your humbleness and your humility and the way you convey it is just so on point. It's just beautiful. And your humbleness is just, it's on another level. I'm really in awe of you. And I know your children are going to be, um, <laughs> it's going to be amazing because um, our children are never, they're always our children, even when they're 26 and now things come up and, you know, and, and um, I recognize some things, but I, it was just so I'm, I'm in awe of your of that you're able to do all of this and that your awareness comes first. And sometimes people have to have something really major happen to them before they have that discernment of I'm not going to I can't do this. I have to take care of the kids. I have to take care of me. It's my and that's what happened to me. But I love that you're sending a message to women and to everybody everywhere that we don't have to wait till something huge happens to us. We can decide to do this. And this is the first time I'm hearing this from someone like you. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just applauding you for that because that message, every woman, every person needs to hear before something they don't need. I know that there's a reason why, and I'm, and I'm so happy that what happened and I'm so I'm embracing and it's loving it, but I'm trying to give that message over to people that we don't have to wait. And you're giving that message. And it's a message that everyone needs to hear. Thank you. And it sounds like you're giving the message too, and that you'll continue to. So Kola Kava, thank you for saying that. We have on here, Ray Shigalov, who really sums up the takeaways from today. Ray runs a passion projects and helps women discover their passions and break it down into action. So Ray wrote, she's very good at breaking things down. I don't know if you wanna come on camera and, and we can close with Ray's takeaways. Ida, were these all your steps? One, <clears throat> reframe being scattered to being dynamic. Ida, I have a lot to offer, I'm just finding my way. Oh, I don't know exactly what that meant. What do you want to do meets what needs to be done? Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, number three. You are not replaceable as a wife and mother. Number four, try one thing with a small commitment and see what happens and what your intuitive partnership with Hashem tells you to do next. And number five, ask a, ment ask a mentor with a bigger vision of you and find accountability. I'm adding that. <clears throat> wow, we could be on all day, but I know that Isa, uh -huh. you have a very you have multi roles to take care of. So we want to have you back, and hopefully we can connect on helping women build build bitachon through their businesses and through their ideas together with Susan. And we'll talk about that because I think that this will actually lead to that, so that women can get a little bit more of you and Susan, such incredible women who are changing the world. Thank you, Ray, for your takeaways. I love that. And I love that everyone takes away what's unique to them. That's the goal. That's really beautiful. Exactly. Yeah.